Uh, we will start right away with Matti Erasari's uh, presentation um, entitled Theoretical Legacies of the Argonauts with side notes on citing versus liking Malinowski. Matti Erasari, welcome. Um, I'll kick off with an apology. I was invited to speak at this event because I believe I'm one of the few people around here who actually cite Malinowski in their work. Um, I was actually going to talk more about ethnography as indicated by the heading of this event, uh, but I got seriously sidetracked into thinking about why I cite Malinowski while I was reading rereading the Argonauts after a long time. Um, I am still on that sidetrack. Um, but think of this short paper as an excursion into the political frames of conducting global ethnography 100 years after the publication of Argonauts. And you'll see that this is not an unconnected rant. It does have a bearing on the things that we've discussed today and will be discussing today. Um, yeah, Malinowski is not in high demand these days. He practiced a kind of functionalist anthropology that at least during my undergraduate years was used as a cautionary, even derisory category, as in, this is where your essay comes dangerously close to functionalism. Um, famously, the Argonauts is also saturated with the discourse on the loss of authenticity, as in the material of ethnographic study melts away with hopeless rapidity. And we all know about the racism, the hyperbole and egotism the man himself is now remembered for, which was canvassed by the publication of Malinowski's diary, but is evident throughout Argonauts too. Malinowski the person has undermined Malinowski the father of ethnographic fieldwork, so effectively that the discipline now generally sees Malinowski as a jerk. Indeed, there are a few easier targets in the field of social cultural anthropology. Why do I start with this? To dissociate myself from Malinowski, to get the easy jibes out of the way. No. Instead, I want to comment on a point that has been bothering me for a few years now at least his anthropology's own how gate, the way people responded to the immoral actions of a publisher by a widespread refusal to cite research published in said journal. But the question of what does a citation stand for has much more widespread relevance today. Indeed, it was only recently that Ilana Gershon made a corresponding point in a social media post, namely, that current politics of academic citation too often follow the logic of financialization. That citations are increasingly viewed as statements about, quote, whether we are recommending investment in a person or their project. Gershon wrote and added, I don't want to treat my fellow colleagues as invest investment projects that I am deciding to signal as creditworthy or not. There are not many works better suited to elaborating these points than Malinowski's Argonauts. I doubt whether anybody really likes Malinowski these days. And being dead, he hardly needs to have his citation indexes boosted or his work acknowledged in the manner of Facebook likes. He is, however, at the root of ideas more numerous than I can sufficiently outline in this short talk. But I will outline a few just to make a quick point. To start with, the most obvious. In the Argonauts of the Western Pacific, Malinowski writes, quote, the kula consists, consists in the bestowing of a ceremonial gift, which has to be repaid by an equivalent counter gift after a lapse of time. That is to say that Malinowski deployed and ethnographically exemplified the idea and language of gifts and counter gifts before Marcel Moss. Indeed, Moss is the gift published three years after the Argonauts builds extensively on Malinowski's ethnography. You could even argue that Moss's essay hinges on Boas's material on the potlatch and Malinowski's Kula stuff, 
supplemented by a wide collection of comparative historical and ethnographic material and glued together by the Maori term how, found in the work of Elston Best. Obviously, Malinowski's take on the business with gifts was different from Moses. Malinowski was very much describing a total social order, which the Trobrianders, which the Trobrianders themselves had no comprehensive understanding of, whose total outline he himself was the author. Malinowski saw the Kula with its division of labor, its laws and ownership structures, technologies, trade routes, and whatnot, as a social organism whose society sustaining functionality could only be seen by a trained scientist. Moss, on the other hand, used it to define a moral disposition that underlines sociability everywhere. One's quest was social mechanical, the other's philosophical. Yet the, st yet the stated motives of the two men have much more in common. Quote, it appears that there has never existed anything resembling what we call a natural economy, Moss writes in The Gift, and one part of humanity, relatively rich, hardworking, and creating considerable surpluses, has known and knows now how to exchange significant things under other forms and for reasons other than those with which we are familiar. Compare that with Malinowski's criticism of the shadowy primitive economic man on whose imaginary behavior many of the scholastic deductions of abstract economics are based, which runs through the Argonauts of the Western Pacific. These are not identical positions. Most was criticizing the idea that so-called natural economics only uh, natural economies only produced for subsistence purposes. And he wanted to show that non-market non societies too actually produce great surpluses for exchange. Malinowski's critique of the primitive economic man is actually much more closer to an ongoing critique of the notion of homo economicus, economic man a view of the human being as a self-interested agent who seeks optimal utility maximizing outcomes. It was this notion that Malinowski wanted to explode once and forever. What I'm getting at is this. Malinowski's influence for later anthropological and ethnographic thought often comes to us through the ideas of Marcel Mauss, who planted the notion of reciprocity into Kula exchange, as it were. There is a general level assumption, which is not fully mistaken, to, um, that Moss, the intellectual, took the material collected by Malinowski, the father of ethnography, and made it really speak to universal concerns. It was Moss who sought to connect the reciprocity underlying exotic ceremonial gifting with the ideas of social contract underlying modern states too, while Malinowski was lamenting the, the disappearance of the objects of ethnographic study, just as he had properly founded the field. Yet the two shared a critical disposition towards the basic assumptions of economics, as well as certain revealing terminological choices, starting with the language of gifts and counter gifts. Or to put it differently, Moses' essay on the gift would have been a very different book without Malinowski. And this is the terrain where I, as an economic anthropologist who studies value and exchanging in Oceania and Europe, keep encountering Malinowski, all intertwined with or embedded in most and consecutive works on exchange, economy, and beyond. Chris Gregory's Gifts and Commodities from 1982, and there's another birthday for you, is a fine example. Unlike sometimes assumed, the book does not argue in favor of a strict division into gift and commodity societies, but rather seeks to explain, quote, the paradox of the efflorescence of gift exchange in a commodity world economy. Gregory discusses gift and commodity exchange as two kinds of economic activity based on very different notions of value. One, commodity exchange of alienable objects between people who are in a state of independence is found in settings which emphasize the control and regulation of a product, pr productive labor, whilst leaving human reproduction relatively uncontrolled. The other, gift exchange of inalienable objects between people who are in a state of reciprocal dependence, exhibits more concern over the reproduction of humans, leaving the production of things more free of control. 
Rather than arguing that two shall never mix, Gregory shows that the opportunity to accumulate surplus in wage labor flowed into gift exchange in 1970s Papua New Guinea. That rather than spending money on commodities, people used their accumulated wealth on rank and kinship related transactions, which make little sense from a strictly economistic point of view. In Gregory's book, published 70 years after the publication of Argonauts, we can still hear reformulations of Malinowski's mission to quote, explode once and forever, the notion of primitive economic man. Indeed, Gregory says as much that gifts and commodities deploys anthropology and political economy against neoclassical economists. And there are numerous others who like Gregory have foregrounded political economic systems and contradict the universalist claim, claims of economics. Here I will only mention two, um, which do so in the Trobrian context. Nancy Munn's The Fame of Gawa and Annette Weiner's Inalienable Possessions. One of them, Munn, foregrounds her portrait of an economic otherwise on the idea of fame as the crucial aspect for understanding what value is in the cooler ring. The other argues that instead of observing things which can be fully detached from their owners, we need to better understand the things whose value and significance cannot be alienated or disengaged from the relationships they embody. Does this get a bit far from academic referencing? Let me be clear. I do not want to give the impression that every time these ideas are raised, one ought to be able to cite the long, leaf of, long list of chiefs, I mean names, associated with the development of a particular concept or theory. Academic citations are not like the histories of cooler items or like Gowan fame. That is to say, they are not, quote, the spatial temporal expansion of self affected um, by the movement or circulation of one's name. They are not the virtual form of influence that man writes about. Or rather, they are not just that, or should not be, anyway. I, for one, do not tilt citations out to people I like, but rather to authors whose work has had an effect on my own work. Malinowski does not need to be referenced every time one talks of gifts or exchange or fame. These ideas have certainly evolved beyond the need to name names. But Malinowski also has his own idiosyncratic way of writing and phrasing his ideas, a way that can even make one see phenomena under discussion from a unique viewpoint. For me, one such instance has been the way Malinowski describes the social histories of cooler items in the Argonauts. He does this by way of comparison with the Scottish crown jewels on display at the Edinburgh Castle, where the keeper of the jewels once told Malinowski about the history and travels of the items. Malinowski describes the subsequent revelation, quote, as I was looking at them and thinking how ugly, useless, ungainly, even tawdry they were, I had the feeling that something similar had been told, told to me of late, and that I had seen many other objects of this, this sort, which made a similar impression on me. Malinowski then goes on to liken the crown jewels to the, quote, long, thin red strings and big, white, worn out objects, clumsy to sight and greasy to touch, end of quote, that he had witnessed in the Trobriand Islands. Comparing the two different valuables, he concludes that, quote, both heirlooms and Vaigua are cherished because of the historical sentiment which surrounds them. However ugly, useless, and according to current standards, valueless an object may be, if it has figured in historical scenes and passed through the hands of historic persons, and is therefore an unfailing vehicle of important sentimental associations, it cannot but be precious to us. I find Malinowski's way of describing the sentimental values adhering to these items as the ugliness or greasiness caused by wear and tear, pretty evocative. For me, it really foregrounds something important about the appearance of value, what value looks like, if you will. This is actually an underexplored theme, 
something that has not been studied too much during the century following the publication of Argonauts. To be fair, this thread was resumed by Maurice Godelier in The Enigma of the Gift, where Godelier concludes that typical Melanesian valuables are beyond function and aesthetics. That, quote, they no longer need to be beautiful, they merely have to be old. But I still find Malinowski, Malinowski more citable on this particular issue. Why? I suppose one answer could be that Malinowski's obvious distaste for useless, worn out objects is a particularly useful lens to different conceptions of value. It may even be, be that part of the evocativeness. It, it may even be that part of the evocativeness of Malinowski's words is actually due to the fact that his idiosyncratic style involves being offensive. He's not just dissing the Trobri and Islanders, but the Scots too. So when I cite this passage, or a slightly condensed, cleaned up version of the full passage anyway. I'm not doing so in admiration of Malinowski's wit. This too is an important difference from the idea of citing as investment or token or as fame. In real life, citations are not one dimensional or flat. We can disagree with the people we cite. We can even express disapproval with them. Truthfully indicating how you have reached a particular view, idea or position so that others may follow that path, usually includes more than just sheer agreement. But none of this is reflected in the one dimensional world of citation indexes. When citations are treated as a metric for measuring the impact or importance of an academic contribution, they do not discriminate between positive and less positive referencing. They also ignore important aspects of circulation, such as time delay or reciprocal obligation, aspects that we, Anthropologists have been studying for generations, in no small part thanks to Malinowski. By reducing citations to simple value tokens, we, in short, disembed them from the world of academic research. In the language of Karl Polanyi, an economic historian who openly admitted being influenced by Malinowski, we could call them fictitious commodities, public goods that are treated as if they are commodities produced for sale on the market. I'm not saying that citations constitute social necessities in the same sense as Polanyi's original fictitious commodities, land, labor, and money. But I deploy the term in order to point out that like land or labor, turning citations into an alienable commodity requires an act of fabrication, pruning the work of citing of all its additional uses, meanings, and connected social practices. Patrick Leonard has illustrated what this means with reference to land. Land is connected to people's social projects in various different ways. It affords things like agriculture, house building, burial, inheritance, titles, ancestral cults, identity, belonging, and so forth. Commercial land, imagined as a stretch, flat stretch of the earth's surface, devoid of such uses, is a fiction. The same can be said of the academic citation. We can, of course, disentangle citation from debates and genealogies of knowledge alienate good ideas from bad authors or publishers, or only invest in those we deem good. But anthropology is lucky. We have over the past 100 years, amassed a great wealth of understanding in the ways of exchanging and valuing, alienating, expanding names or disentangling and fictifying. It's thanks to the work of Malinowski in the Argonauts and those who have followed it, that we are able to differentiate between these different aspects of value allocation we would not be stumbling into that territory blindly. Personally, I prefer the greasy, totally ungainly quote that indicates where my mind has traveled before reaching a particular destination. For me, it stands for an intellectual honesty, whilst tailoring my citations to suit my political views and social networks is too close to the economy of a Facebook like. This is why I don't like Malinowski. I cite Malinowski. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Matti. And uh, are there any comments or questions for Matti?
I said it all, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, th uh, thanks uh, for uh, a refreshing uh, take on the uh, yeah politics and political economy of citations as and as um uh sorry this um i haven't formulated this well enough but since you are uh, um expert on value and value metrics uh as well as publications uh, so um do you see like merit in the like current uh value metric and tracing of uh, a metric of uh, citations and tracing them and can have you thought about uh, what would be an alternative way of uh, or an alternative metric to the current citation indexes have you pondered upon this issue like from the perspective of publishing and or of value and organizing values Two questions. Um, have I thought about alternatives? And yes, um, can I suggest a better way? Probably no. Um, but I do think these kind of different different ways of organizing this mode of evaluation all have their merits and all have their dismerits. Um, um, I've been talking about the base, basic unit of, of university funding, which is the peer reviewed article. And you know, that already has had a huge impact on the way we do science. We now produce article sized ideas much more than monograph sized ideas or short provocative essays or book reviews or something else. Um, so the way we approach the task of publishing is already affected seriously by the fact that we have this one basic unit. Compared to this, um, I suppose the citation index is a different beast altogether. Um, and it seems to be prone to all kinds of um, favoritisms. It's obvious that it favors people um, who get published and cited in the big uh, prestigious universities compared to people trying to make their voices heard from the margins and so forth. It's not, it, it's far, far from uh, an ideal system in my opinion. But then um, Marilyn Strathern once wrote, I've got it here somewhere. Um, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And, and I suppose this is what the politics of, of referencing is doing at the moment. We recognize citations as a vessel of values and we act accordingly. We seek them out, but we also try to balance them out. We have political ways of addressing this issue and, and people are acting to that end. And I suppose that will have a short-term effect. It will balance out some of these imbalances uh, in the academic world. But as soon as you know, the big metrics people catch on to this, they'll just find another metric. That's kind of my cynical ramble to your question. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. Uh, in a way, you kind of commented on this already with this politics of citation uh, thing, because what you were uh, referring to Ilana's, uh, Ilana Gershon's idea that the uh, the financial logics of, of financialization uh, have come to the 
citational politics, but uh, and it made uh, made me think of this. I, I think this is Roy DeAndre's old argument against moralist anthropology that power is just power. Like power can be oppression, but it can also be protection, for example. And uh, calling it these terms. Uh, just uh, takes a moralist take when power is just power. So also politics of citation is just politics of citation and it can be either regressive or it can be progressive. Uh, but you it, you already, so I wanted to ask you to comment on this, but you also already indicated that you think that uh, the politics of citation, the system as it is, it's only, it's unrectifiable in, in the long term. But do you have any more thoughts on this? Yeah. Nothing much to add, really. I, I think, I mean, I agree with you. And I, I, I obviously, I've made my own personal views very clear in this. But I also see that, you know, if, if we understand that the system of citation is assembled out of various different um, alternative takes on what value is and where value is, then, then they can work to various different, to, to the benefit of various different logics. You know, it can be, it can be fame, it can be finance, it can be histories, it can be all these things. And and um, so so, uh, yeah. My question is also unformulated, but first of all, thank you. I found this, like Thomas said, it was incredibly refreshing, um, a take on things, but sort of what I'm thinking in my mind as an early career scholar um, is again, in relation to the broader theme of decolonizing anthropology and whatever that means, um, is that if we want to cite somebody, we need to first, put in a lot of time and effort into actually reading that person's work. And I, I'm somehow trying to puzzle together what that means. Like if we are to think about citation politics, what does it mean in terms of curriculum politics and what it could mean and whether you could somehow expand from Malinowski's ideas or ideas of a gift or reciprocity into what that means in terms of what it is we read, because it's we often talk about citations as gifts and about you nodding to the right people and telling them that, yes, you've read their work. But if we really think about the practice of doing research and this particularly for, for students who are writing their theses or who are doing their PhDs, I think of my own experience. I spent years making sure that I know how to cite the right people. And it led me to disregard huge amounts of literature, for instance, from the region that I was studying because it wasn't so relevant for the citation politics of that time. So I don't know, just, just a rambling thought of what does this mean? What does this ref reflecting on citation politics, what does it mean for whether we read Malinowski in our classes or whether we read something else? Um. Luckily, I'm not in a position to make decisions on those because I, I think that's a that's a complicated question, um, and I haven't even begun to thought of, to to think about it. Um, all I can say is is that in in terms of how people now do politics with citing citation, I think there are two things that get sometimes muddled together. One of them is this kind of ban on, on citing people you don't like. And the other is obviously trying to push up a more versatile um, repertoire of literature, of, of things to cite. Here we then come back to, to what I was saying about these limited length peer reviewed articles. The first place to cut when you go over your 10,000 words is to take the unnecessary reference away from your list. So all of a sudden, you you might include a couple of sympathy likes in there, you know, to balance out things a bit and, and to get a more versatile group of, of people cited. But then when the editor lets you know that you can't go above 10,000 words, those are the ones that 
need to be omitted. Um, does this really answer your question? No. It, it's a good question, though. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. So I, I won't post a question, rather a comment. You said that the first thing to cut off is the citation. I think in an ethnographic article, it's the ethnographic description that goes first. <laughs> so uh, can you share a little, uh, a few of your thoughts, how to overcome this challenge for the whole ethnographic, uh, ethnographic production of knowledge in the future? But of course, I've thought about this. And I, I, I do think that that we should be able to somehow diversify the range of kinds of texts that we produce. It's not easy when our home institutions institutions get four to from four to. 20,000 euros for every peer reviewed article we publish. We are being very, very strongly pushed in a certain direction. But at the same time, we can keep it in mind that there are other genres and there are other styles of argument, there are other text genres and so forth. But of course, um, when we act as, as the peer reviewers of texts or the editors of books or journals, we can also make sure that the omission doesn't always hit on the, that particular ethnographic description, especially since it has the tendency to make these articles worse. The fact that we condense them and condense them and cram them into tighter and tighter pieces of words where every word that gives your time a little bit of breathing space is finally omitted until you only have this kind of dry, uh, dense thing that you can't digest. Um, it does nobody any favors. Okay, thank you. Uh, Venla, can you check out the, the one comment on Zoom? There's one question. Well, yeah, we can do it fast. I think in in Malinowski's case, it's very easy. It's Malinowski all the way through. He he's speaking. He's um, we all know that it's his representation, but of course, we would want to hear both. We would want to hear what Malinowski formulated out of all of that, and then we'd like to hear the other voice as well. So um, for me, it it shouldn't be either or, but it. But as long as what we have, if all we had on the Kula would have been Malinowski, then it need then then for better or for worse, we'd have to cite it in Malinowski's name because it's his interpretation, and there have been many interpretations afterwards. Um, but um, yes, I, I, we are lucky to have other voices too. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Matti, and thank you for the questions, and let's applaud Matti.